Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Sarah Pisano. I am Program Director with Target Zero. And I want to thank Maddie's Fund for hosting this webinar that I feel is so incredibly important to build a foundation for humane communities for both dogs and cats in our, um, all our communities across the United States. So the title of our presentation is Creating Responsible Life-Saving Public Policies. And I come from a background as a veterinarian. I graduated from Cornell in 1994, and I was a part of a private open admission shelter and also um, a private limited admission shelter, after which time I was a, um, a public shelter director myself. And during that time, I rewrote ordinances, I had enforcement, I and mean, we were really able to transform the shelter and bring it into modern times because we have so much more knowledge now. So we are being joined today by elected officials, some people who are those change agents in our legislative roles, perhaps mayors and commissioners, we also have shelter workers and animal welfare advocates, and we hope that you will sh continue to share this webinar with your elected officials because this will be on demand for the next year. It will be on the Maddie's Fund website. And if you um, look at the green file widget at the bottom of the slide, you can click on that and have access to a handout that's kind of just a brief synopsis that you can use as a handout for public officials as well. And that handout will also be on the Maddie's Fund uh, website as well. So I come to you saying that whoever you are listening to this and whatever position you play in animal welfare, I really can relate to your role and I have in some way been connected to whatever you're doing. So now what I do in my role as Target Zero's program director is we look for open admission shelters, which are typically public shelters, and we are a charitable initiative and all our work is done pro bono. So we are looking at helping shelters productively decrease intake, and I'm going to talk to you about what that actually means, and then achieving and maintaining that 90% live outcome. But because there are many elected officials listening to this, I just wanted to start with a couple of basic definitions, because this is somewhat of a mystery, I think, to the public still. And so a lot of people don't understand the difference between an open admission shelter and a limited admission shelter. So to start with a limited admission shelter, they are always private, nonprofit, 501c3s. They can structure their organization however they like. They could possibly um, take in as many animals as they want. They could limit the number of animals they want. They could say, we're not going to take animals with blue eyes, whatever the situation is. Typically, they're taking far less animals as compared to the open admission shelter in their communities. To give you an example, in my community, the private shelter handles about 2,000 animals a year, and the high intake at the public shelter was 37,000 animals a year. So a huge difference, and then they can, because they can limit who they are accepting into the shelter, perhaps they want to only take in animals that they know they could get adopted quickly and that's fine, they are typically what you hear of as no-kill, um, which means that over 90% of the animals are being saved. So there's different names for those types of organizations. Again, limited admission, adoption guarantee, no kill. You might hear all of those different terms. But as an elected official or someone in the public sector, you might not understand that why there is so much criticism of our open admission shelters. And I do believe it's because the public doesn't understand that those numbers in a private shelter can be limited. So an open admission shelter, as I said, it could be private, 
or it could be public, and that's municipal, perhaps city or county or a combination of both. And historically, besides taking in so many more animals, um, the save rate, the number of animals saved, is typically far lower than a limited admission shelter. And because they are a public shelter, um, the municipal shelters, they have less autonomy, obviously, than a nonprofit private shelter. So historically, and I know how I felt 15 years ago as a public shelter director, that we feel victimized. We feel that we have no control over the number of animals coming into the shelter. We cannot turn animals away. But I'm here to tell you that there is a different way to think about sheltering and that we have an obligation to think differently about sheltering. And if you might think about, I was just Googling a smoking ad from the 1950s, and the ad said, nine out of ten doctors recommend smoking camel cigarettes. So in the 50s, doctors were recommending that people smoke and inhale that tobacco deeply to help with your lung disease. Well, I don't have to go into detail about how differently we view smoking today, but I often think of the analogy between animal welfare and how we used to think about sheltering animals and how we are obligated to now think because we have different data. So we know, again, when we say that 90% or more live outcome, we know with our open admission shelters and our public shelters in particular that there will always be euthanasia because there will be large, aggressive dogs that cannot be safely rehabilitated, and that's a very small small percentage. And then there will be medical cases that are too far advanced for us to save. So there will always be some level of euthanasia. But the interesting thing today in 2016, we are seeing even large open emission shelters get to that 90%, not because they're saving so many more animals. The number of animals might not be going up, but we're thinking more intelligently and strategically about who needs to come in the shelter and how we can help them outside the shelter system. So they're getting to the 90% as a function of decreasing intake, which is really, really important. We are talking about helping people solve their problems. So Target Zero and sheltering is dogs and cats, but our presentation today will focus on cats for a very good reason. We are talking about best practices that are not just the Target Zero ideas, but these are best practices. Um, certainly Maddie's Fund is one of the major um, organizations and obviously started the Million Cat Challenge with Drs. Hurley and Levy that um, really are proponents of community cat diversion and community cat um, programs. So all of the major national animal welfare organizations are on the same page. And so we're not introducing something new or novel. This is what is considered now best practice and what the challenge is for all of us. And I can promise you 15 years ago, I wasn't saying these things. I had these fears and I had these beliefs that if I did something like return a cat to the field after it's sterilized, where it came from, that there would be a negative outcome. So I'm asking you all to just listen to the presentation with an open mind and understanding and listening to the data because we have studies and data and so many amazing examples of why we should be doing things differently, but it certainly will take and does take a culture shift. The communities that are doing these programs in a big way didn't start having their culture um, accepting these community cap programs, but I can tell you, boy, they really are now. So we have to go back to the basics and say, well, what was the reason that a municipal shelter was even created to begin with? 
municipal shelters were created to protect animals from dangerous people and to protect um, dangerous animals from people. I'm sorry, protect people from dangerous animals and animals from dangerous people. So that is the main gist of why municipal shelters existed. And then along the way, people said, oh, well, I can't keep my dog, so I'll take him to the shelter because they may they can find them a home. So it has expanded to accept all these animals that are not in these categories of the animals that really do need to come into the shelter. So your cruelty cases, your abuse cases, your dangerous dogs that um, are a threat to the public, those types of animals. But now we need to say, wait a minute, we have the opportunity as a municipal entity to collaborate with nonprofit organizations, to be fiscally responsible, but most importantly, to solve problems for constituents. Because so far and for so long, we have been on this hamster wheel of just animals being left in the shelter, and now we're just struggling to try to save their lives. And euthanasia is no longer acceptable as population control. So we, and the good thing is, it doesn't have to be. We can structure our programs differently, and the foundation for that is responsible public policy. So what we find, and Target Zero works all over the country, we find in communities that are saving a very small percentage of the animals, so it could be even 11% or lower of the cats in particular, 20%, there are common self-imposed barriers and there are ways that ordinances can be changed, programs design can be different, um, but we need to look at these outdated ordinances and certainly we know they were created with the good intentions and this might be decades ago because we often see very old ordinances um, because it's so laborious to change ordinances and in particular state laws. But when those ordinances were created, it was not done so with effective data. We are getting better now in the age of technology and we have more data easily collected in our shelters so that we can identify trends, but there is still a lag with um, other industries and data collection is still um, in need of much, much improvement. But we look at these ordinances and say, wait a minute, this ordinance X was created to achieve this goal. However, now that we examine the data and we look at all this information, they are barriers to best practice and they're actually barriers to our goals. So we need to think about um, being responsible lawmakers and that is tied into being fiscally responsible. So having ordinances in line with best practice equals being fiscally responsible with public monies. And the good news for animal welfare advocates is that ends up saving lives as well. So it's all positive. So Target Zero does shelter and community assessments, and we have 10 times around the country in the last couple of years tried to um, revise ordinances in particular for community cats. And 10 times we were successful because we present these facts and say, look, what you're doing here doesn't make sense. And we are not, again, asking you to go out on a limb and try something new. We're saying this is proven. So just join us and take this leap of faith. And we promise you that it is a win-win. So in particular, what we are looking for and what we are attempting to revise in ordinances regarding cats is removing stray holds for cats when they are eligible for community cat diversion. And I'll be defining those things as well. We know that in most shelters, and certainly the shelters that are euthanizing the majority of the animals, the return to owner rates for cats is less than 2%. So the shelters in the last three years that we've done assessments on, absolutely far lower than 
2%. So we may have a stray hold of three days, five days. There's sometimes seven days. There's some states that have a seven-day stray hold. So when we think about the cost of housing, care, staffing, certainly there will be overcrowding because of this mandatory stray hold. Cats will get sick. They will then either have to be euthanized or have a lower chance of getting adopted. And then the other option is to treat them. So now there's a higher cost of care for less than 2% or very, very small percent that would have gone back to their owners. And we talked to a shelter just yesterday handling 30,000 animals a year with exactly a 2% return to owner rate for cats. So this is an issue across the board. What we're saying is community cat diversion and the program that we're recommending returns cats home. This is the return to owner home, um, program that we should be doing in our shelters. And so a stray hold for cats serves no purpose. It wastes a lot of money. It puts cats at risk of being sick and ultimately losing their lives. We also see a very strange part of our ordinances that require a leash law for cats. And I'm not sure where that ever started from, but cats don't allow themselves to be walked on leashes like dogs. And apparently that needs to be said because it's frequent that we see leash laws for cats. We know that a lot of people let their cats have access to the outside. We know that cats are free roaming. That's part of, you know, there's feral cats or there's cats that prefer to live outside and that they don't pose the same threat as dogs when dogs are free roaming. Now, we also want to mention that our goal is to have cats inside. We would love if all cats lived inside, they were safe and sound, and never had to worry about um, any of the dangers that they might face, even if they are inside and outside. So hands down, we would prefer that. But the second option is to have them sterilized so that they do not continue to exponentially reproduce. And this is where cats and people get into problems. When those cats reproduce exponentially, now you have a colony. What we are recommending is colony prevention. We don't want colonies, we want less cats outside. So the other thing is that there are typically abandonment clauses in our ordinances, right? And that is an amazing way to protect animals um, from people dropping them off in the middle of nowhere with malicious intent. And again, that was the intent of that part of the ordinance. When we talk about community cat diversion or returning cats to their original location where they already had a food source, then that is not abandonment. We are returning them to their food source. An example of abandonment would be to sterilize them and take them 50 miles away and drop them on a dirt road. That's abandonment. So we want the community cat to be exempt from the clause regarding abandonment. So trap, neuter, return, oh, there's actually one more thing I want to um, want to discuss, and that's licensing. Um, because a lot of these cats might not be um, able to be handled by people. Some people call them feral. Some people call them just not socialized with people. But in any event, um, it, cats just don't like to have collars on their necks. And so a license and a tag and all of those things is not a plausible solution to how we're going to identify cats. If we're going, we would love all cats to be identified and a registered microchip is a great way. Um, but the collars just simply do not, those cats, cats find a way to get those collars off. Our goal is that we want the cats sterilized so that they stop the exponential reproduction and we certainly want them vaccinated against rabies. So if you already license in dogs and cats, consider licensing dogs only. So the definition of community cat 
is a cat that's outside. This could be a friendly cat. It could be a feral cat. It's one that is goes inside and outside or just stays outside. So it is very much a loose term. Sometimes people call community cats free-roaming cats. So we um, also want to distinguish um, just two parts of what we're talking about today. Trap, neuter, return, to us, we define it as something that's happening in the community and it's independent of the shelter. We can assure you that trap, neuter, return, wherever you are in the United States, is already happening in your community. But yet we sometimes see ordinances that prohibit feeding cats outside. And I want to encourage our elected officials it is not possible to codify compassion out of people. And so when you put something like that in your ordinance or you cite people for feeding cats, they will feed cats at 3 in the morning. They will do it. They will take care of those cats because it is a compassionate thing to do. So we need to, again, think what are our ordinances in place for? It's protecting people from dangerous animals and protecting animals from dangerous people. So compassion will always be a component in all of us, and we really cannot have items in there that, that codify it out of us. It's just not possible. So TNR, trap, new to return, that's in the field, independent of the shelter. So community cat diversion is what we define as the program whereby Somebody finds an outside cat, perhaps it's a good Samaritan, it's, somebody calls animal control, and the cat was found outside and is brought to the shelter. The majority of these cats are brought to the shelter because we have trained the public to take cats they see and dogs that they see outside to the shelter so their owners can, quote, unquote, find them. But we now know with cats, that's not happening and that we have a better way and a better proposal, it is not true that the cats are ending up in the shelter because everybody hates cats. So we often hear people, again, all over the country say, well, our community is different. Everybody hates cats here. We can tell you that that's not true. Um, and those those words like never or always um, are um, not typically accurate. So we have to think about, gosh, you know, our animal control officers, they're seeing the worst of the worst. So, yeah, they might think everybody hates cats, but they're seeing a very, very small microcosm of the pet owners in our country, of beloved pet owners and the HSUS adoption guidelines say it so eloquently in um, the numbers that they provide. 144 million animals and families in the United States, 6 to 8 million going into our shelters, and a very small fraction of those victims of cruelty, neglect, or a true abandonment. But yet, our shelter, when you know, our, as shelter workers, that's what we think of first because that's our microcosm. So I encourage everybody to think about the reality of what's happening and encourage you to look at programmatically how can we look at this problem of cats reproducing outside and make an impact in a realistic way. So the program is instead of taking that outside cat into the shelter, it is of healthy body weight. We know that it's being fed because it's 10 or 12 pounds. It has a good, um, healthy coat. Um, we know that somebody is feeding it. We might not know who. And, again, this is something that I had a very hard time with as public shelter director, letting go of that desire to know who is feeding that cat. But when you think about it, when the majority of cats are being euthanized, and I'm looking at this cat, and it's visually healthy and has a, a good body weight and good body coat, or, um, a healthy body coat, that 
we know someone is feeding or multiple people are feeding this cat. We hear lots of stories about cats coming back to people and saying, wait a second, you're my outside cat. How come you have a different collar on today? So we know that cats are smart and they'll go breakfast, lunch, and dinner to different houses and multiple have multiple food sources. So vaccinate those cats against rabies, spay, neuter, ear tip them, which is the standard identification to identify a cat as sterilized, and return them to their outside home. These cats are not lost. They are not stray. Um, they are um, probably going from one meal to the next, and somebody said, oh, let me scoop up this cat and take him to the shelter, or um, we have somebody who's upset because the neighbor's cat and is reproducing, and there are cats on their property. And I can promise you as a homeowner, I don't want a cat spraying on my door. That's not acceptable. So, again, if we got to that cat owner, that neighbor cat owner, when they had two cats, we could have prevented cats getting themselves into trouble. We're so excited about the Million Cat Challenge, and if those of you have not heard about um, the amazing milliongatchallenge.org, where we are on a quest and well on our way to saving a million cats and changing the way we look at cats and sheltering in the United States. So we, um, again, have fancy studies and facts now that we didn't have before, and we know that cats are seven to ten times more likely to find their way home from the street or find another home from the street versus a shelter. So what a disservice we do to take those outside cats into the shelter when we know, gosh, many people let their cats inside and out. Very few of them are reclaimed by their owners. The majority of cats in the United States shelters are euthanized. And then when we just trap and euthanize, we do absolutely nothing to help solve the root of the problem, which is your neighbor's first two cats. And that's what this problem addresses. So now we have to say, well, what happens in the community? Well, now, right, I've decreased the potential number of community cats in the next several months and years, which is a huge impact. Now I have less cats, but I have more of them vaccinated against rabies, so I have a higher community immunity against rabies, which right now I have zero and less than zero because now I have cats reproducing that will never be vaccinated if I'm not doing this program. And here's the crazy thing. Most sheltered directors that are not doing this program fear, and animal control leaders fear that this will just unleash a rash of complaints about cats. This will not be accepted in their community. And what is astonishing is that every single community across the board, and there are many, many hundreds around the country, cat complaints virtually disappear. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when I tell you uh, more about the Jacksonville story. Again, we want to look at this is not a free-for-all for cats. We have wildlife-sensitive areas. We have areas where we absolutely don't want cats fed. I dealt with a situation as a public shelter director where there were cat feeders in our parks feeding cats right where a very um, – endangered migratory bird was landing. So once we had a discussion about that, and that was really the crux of the problem, we were able to not only address the spay neuter, but move those feeding stations. We don't want wildlife at risk because of community cats. We want everything, everyone and everybody who cares about our parks, our wildlife, our community cats, our children, there's less parasites, there's less risk of rabies. This is only a positive. There's only positive repercussions in the community. What happens at the shelter is nothing less than miraculous and something that I never thought I would see in my lifetime, and I'm so excited about it, is that now 
typically the split between strays and owner surrenders in our municipal shelters is about 80% strays, quote unquote, and 20% owner surrenders. So we see a very drastic decrease in shelter intake, therefore a much lower level of competition for those cats that have no other alternative but to enter the shelter. So those may be our indoor only cats, our um, declawed cats, our sick cats, et cetera. There is far less competition for adoption. And we now see with our fellows empty cat cages and over 90% live outcome for cats because we have intelligently handled and solved a problem instead of overcrowding our, crowding our shelter with animals that didn't need to be there. So say you don't care about cats and you don't even like cats. This program benefits dogs in a major way. So you should be supporting community cat diversion if you don't like cats because, number one, there will be less cats outside, Number two, it frees up shelter staff that are always so limited in their time to help counsel people. We can help provide more safety net and more intake prevention programs for dogs and for cats, and we can provide better enrichment if they do have to enter the shelter. So we have more resources for dogs overall, more money, more staff, more space, more volunteer time. We have a shelter that we work with, a very large public shelter, that actually turned one of their gargantuan cat rooms into a dog adoption room. So it really is a game changer and this is one of the ways when we say productively decreasing shelter intake we are not talking about slamming the door in people's faces we're talking about helping our constituents and that's the most important thing that I hope to get across today Greenville South Carolina is an amazing example of success so in 2015, they weren't doing this program. Again, majority of cats getting euthanized. The shelter was grossly overcrowded with cats. And we said, listen, your animal control officers should only be bringing in cats that need to enter the shelter, or maybe they can take them directly to spay-neuter. However, the only ones they should be bringing into the shelter must be the ones that have to enter the shelter, sick injured, confiscations, abuse cases, those that truly need to be in the shelter. And they said to the public, hey, could you take this outside cat because we know somebody's feeding it and you just brought them here because you cared. Could you take this cat to spay neuter? Pick that cat up and put him back where you found him. And what happened, again, is just a beautiful case example and one of so many great stories out there. The animal control officers, May and June of 2015, brought in 255 cats. In May and June, same two-month time period, in 2016, 10. What other program in a shelter can truly make a big impact like this in a positive way. And look at what happened with those Good Samaritans. 53% decrease in intake because half of those people said, I'll go, I'll take this cat to spay neuter, and I will return them to their outside home. Thank you for educating me because I brought them to the shelter because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. So what an amazing testament to engaging the community because for far too long in our public shelters, we have just hid behind this veil of shame and secrecy and we don't want people to call us murderers and killers. We're here because we love animals and we want to change and we want to make a difference, but we don't want to tell anybody that they may be euthanized. So thankfully now we are waking up and so many great shelters are doing it right and saying to the community, hey, this is what's happening here. We need your help. Here's how you can plug in. I know you can't save 20,000 animals, but could you take a litter of two kittens today? 
Could you maybe adopt a dog tomorrow? Could you help in some way? Could you volunteer? Could you network on behalf of these animals? And so, again, the foundation for these programs are if they start with effective public policy. And not Greenville not only was able to um, change their ordinances, but they have been instrumental in changing ordinances in their neighboring counties as well. So we are just so excited to be working with them and tell you about their story because, again, we are not asking you to do something that has not been done before. There are many organizations that have gone before for you that have had the same fears, that have had the same concerns, and they're proving that these are successful programs. And in Jacksonville, Florida, back in 2007, this was not being done, and almost 11,000 cats lost their lives that year. First Coast Normal Homeless Pets is the largest spay-neuter clinic in the country, and at the time, they were the only ones in town ear-tipping cats. And so when those cats ended up at the public shelter, the city shelter, and were euthanized, that was obviously upsetting to them because they had invested money in those cats and wanted their lives saved. So they said to the director, if we could pick up those cats, would you allow us to put them back in the neighborhoods they were found? And at the time, the public shelter director said, well, if it's good for those cats, why don't you take all the outside cats? And so that's what they did. And Cameron Moore on my team We'll be doing a presentation tonight at 6 o'clock, another Maddie's webinar. Again, so thankful to Maddie's. And she's going to tell the, the Jacksonville story and how she brought and her team brought 25,000 cats through this program in Jacksonville. And again, back then, this was foreign to everybody, and even I thought they were crazy for doing it. Over 5,400 cats were brought through the program that first year. Animal Control said, you could do it, but we're going to give Cameron's personal cell phone so that you're going to handle all the complaints. And over 5,400 cats went through the program. Cameron got 12 calls that year, the entire year. And those were calls from complainers that would have, they're complaining about a pothole, a street light, and everything else under the sun, and she helped them solve their problems. But there's going to be sometimes people, you can't help them because they're just going to complain about anything. But Cameron also did something very significant, and she kept a lot of data on those cats, and less than 1% of those 25,000 cats were too sick, ill, or injured to get put back. So it is not true that all of these cats being brought to the shelter that were found outside are not surviving. The majority of them are healthy, and we sterilize them, put them back. So two reasons you will see the same trends in decreasing intake as you look at these next set of graphs. The bar is the total shelter intake. The green on the bottom is live outcome, and the blue is euthanasia. The the intake is decreasing because there's a lot of targeted spay-neuter going on in these communities in the next several slides over the years that we've sterilized. Remember those first two cats that our neighbor had living outside. So there's no more hamster wheel of bringing cats to the shelter and euthanizing, bringing cats to the shelter and euthanizing. There's no cats left in that house or in that yard to bring to the shelter. And the second is relating back to the Greenville story, is that now the Good Samaritans know, oh, I'm going to just go to spay-neuter. I landed in, I don't live in Jacksonville, I landed there several months ago to rent my car, and the Hertz rent-a-car person saw the logo of dog and cat on my shirt and said, oh, you work for animal welfare. If you see an ear-tipped cat here in Jacksonville, don't take them to the shelter because they are a sterilized community cat. And I almost jumped over the counter to hug the guy. I mean, what an amazing testament of how a community can be changed when we have the foundation of not just our ordinances and public policy, but our program designs and our shelter workers and our enforcement teams all on the same page. 
So the next example is Indianapolis. We started this program there in 2013, which is why you can see the jump in live outcome over the next several years. Lots of great spay-neuter going on there by the Face Spay-Neuter Clinic as well. And you can see that this is a community that also got to 90% for cats um, in their first two years as a Target Zero Fellow, which is really exciting. And now they're, they finished their last fiscal year at 86% overall, but really, really encouraging. Waco, Texas, an amazing story because this is a community that has a 30% poverty rate. So a lot of times when we look at, we work with other shelters we um, or communities, people say, oh, you know, it's not going to work here because we're too poor. Well, what an amazing testament um, Waco, Texas is because they changed the ordinances, they started doing community cat diversion, they have an amazing spay-neuter clinic nonprofit in the community, and the same thing happened. So again, you can see the decrease in intake was looks just like Jacksonville. The blue is euthanasia, and again, these communities are getting to 90%, not because of an exponential increase in the number of animals saved, it's because we're a effectively decreasing intake in a productive way by helping constituents. So this is another community that you might go there and see a blind cat in adoptions or a 20-year-old cat in adoptions, and they just get adopted because there's no competition for them. Those would have been the cats that would have been euthanized first because they would have never gotten adopted in the past. Not to say that they're all sick and diseased, but I'm just trying to make the point that they have no competition or far less competition um, for adoption. Huntsville, Alabama, same story. They started this program in 2014, and in fact, their animal control officers do return their cats, and that is why there's a big jump between 2013 and 2014. So you see a high jump in the live outcome, same decrease in spay-neuter, um, and I will... Um, wanted to talk about um, some other crucial initiatives in my last several minutes, um, but often people ask us, well, who pays for this and who does what? And the answer is lots of ways, and it looks differently in every community. So public-private collaboration is absolutely key. Um, there's grant money, there's donations, there's public money, there's some funding that could be done at the local level with private donors that want to see animals saved from the shelter. And the more animals that are saved in your shelter, the more success, that success attracts success, people will want to help you. So there isn't one formula. There's communities where a nonprofit picks up the cats from the public shelter and, and sterilizes them and puts them back. There's some sh public shelters that do the whole thing, soup to nuts. There's other shelters where the um, nonprofit um, might do everything as well. So it just really depends on the community, and there's all different kinds of ways that collaboration could happen, but sitting down at the table with all the animal welfare leaders and saying, who has what, and how can we capitalize on our differences, our successes, and our strengths? Because I can assure you 100% of the time it can be done. And talk about a cost savings in decreasing that intake that, um, that really translates into amazing decrease in cost of care. But there's also a couple of other important points I want to leave you with because with, along with solutions for community cats, um, there are other things that you need to pay attention to, especially as an elected official. We now know, and Peter Marsh has done the most research on this, he's written two amazing books, Replacing Myth with Math and Getting to Zero. And what he showed, his studies show, is that the most animals of, that are left at our public shelters, our open admission shelters, are from low-income pet owners, and, they, and they're not sterilized, and 
they are not sterilized um, because people do not want to sterilize them. It's because they don't have the opportunity financially. So even a low-cost surgery for me would be $90. That is out of reach for a fixed income pet owner. So um, what we know is in every community that does it, again, this link is when we heavily subsidize fixed income pet owners, and we're talking surgeries that are free or definitely not over $20, that we can decrease shelter intake. And that is because then there's no more animals being born. So talk about a productive way to decrease intake. We do recommend about a five to 10 of those subsidized surgeries per thousand residents in your community every year be done for you to see a decrease in intake. Large dogs are a very important part, obviously community cats, which we already talked about, and then high intake areas where your animal control officers are constantly answering calls. Those high intake areas can all be turned into low intake areas. So again, Jacksonville doing a lot of targeted spay-neuter. The line on the bottom, the orange line is targeted spay-neuter and intake and euthanasia going down. So we're just about to finish here and I'm gonna open it up for questions. I just have a couple of more slides. And Huntsville, Alabama is an amazing case study because you can see that the number of surgeries, which is that bottom line, about 2,000 surgeries each year, and that's just for fixed income pet owners by a nonprofit and now a collaboration with the city of, the, of, of Huntsville. What happened in Huntsville is the intake at the shelter went from over 10,000 to a little over 5,000, and the only thing that changed in their community was fixed income spay-neuter subsidies. So again, euthanasia is a function of the intake and a great case study, and Waco, Texas, again, looks just like the Jacksonville, and this is exactly what we wanna see. We want to see that there is a direct inverse correlation, so the number of surgeries goes up, and intake and euthanasia goes down. Managed intake is also called safety net or surrender prevention, and this means that we are going to try to help that pet owner either keep their pet and see what resources they need, or place their pet outside of the shelter system because often the shelter is their first stop, not their last option. And we want to make sure that we are turning our Good Samaritans into foster homes. And again, great research coming out last year in 2015, the ASPCA did a retrospective study that showed 30 to 40 percent of the animals that were surrendered, those pet owners did not want to surrender. They just needed temporary help. What an amazing opportunity we have to collaborate with our public and private entities to build this network of resources in our communities to help people keep their pets and keep them out of the shelter. In 2015, Maddie's funded a survey that showed that even though open admission shelters need the most help, they are the least likely to ask and that when we ask Good Samaritans if they'll foster and provide them with assistance, that means we're gonna sterilize that litter and vaccinate with them when they're old enough, they are more likely to help foster those babies or those animals and keep them out of the shelter system. So amazing data and so grateful to these organizations for looking at um, these topics and giving us such great information. Um, intervention starts at the time of the appointment when the owner calls and says, I need help or I need to surrender my pet. You know, and we thought, oh, gee, if you, know, you, if you divert 30%, that would be a success. Well, our, our Target Zero Fellers in Brevard County that's run by the Sheriff's Office here in Florida it has diverted 80% of the owner surrenders, dogs and cats, since December of 2015 when they started. So that is 
just amazing data because we thought that if they did, you know, less than half of that, that would be a success. So really encouraging you all to look at this is all, you know, Maddie's and all the other organizations have great webinars. There's lots of information online about managed intake as well. So we want to encourage you and and educate you and assure you that responsible public policy can work with um, life-saving efforts and that can all happen within the framework of our municipal shelters. Our website is there at the bottom, target-zero.org, and we would encourage you to look at it and wish you the best of luck and reach out to us if there's any questions after today's questions that we can answer um, or help your community in any way. And we are going to open it up for questions now and want to thank again Maddie's for this forum and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Pisano. Um, this is Lynn Fridley. I'm the Assistant Director of Education, and we'll be getting your questions answered. So I'm going to push the first one to the slide area so you can see it. Dr. Pisano, what are the effective ways to get access to local officials to build a working relationship? Any tips? Absolutely. So. Um, we really need to support our public shelters, so I think volunteering at the shelter, helping in some way, and being a positive influence. It is a difficult environment, and there, it is very easy to be an armchair quarterback and criticize, but we encourage you to be a positive force at the shelter, see what you can do to help, and then um, encourage the shelter director to meet with you and to meet with your elected officials one-on-one. -on -one, I would encourage doing first because, you know, it's a conversation that needs to be had, and we need to make sure that when we approach our elected officials that it is done so with information and data in a very professional and unemotional way. In a, and this is a very emotional topic because saving lives is a very emotional to all of us, but we have to remember that we need to approach this in a very positive way so that we can get these ordinances changed. I'm, I think that this presentation is a great thing to pass along to your elected officials and, and you can offer to meet with them. Be part of the solution instead of criticizing and telling other people what they should be doing. Get on the same team and we promise you, you can create change. Thank you, that was a great question. So. What is the first step if you want to change your ordinance? Now, getting on board and being positive and talking to your officials is one thing, but what is the first step? Well, I would recommend meeting, reviewing the ordinance, and then meeting with the shelter director about those changes. And in some places, it might be the enforcement director. You have to see how the um, animal control department is set up some shelter directors are just over the shelter, and some are over enforcement as well. So figure out who the director is, who is the one that would pre present an ordinance change. Meet with that person or that team first about these ideas, and then go to the next step, which would be meeting with either the council or the county manager or mayor in the community. It's just a little bit different in each community. But you also have to understand the structure of gov local government in your community. So sometimes the, there's a strong mayor who has voting power, and sometimes the council votes so you have to look at all of those things and learn a little bit about how your local government works first. Thank you. And this is another follow-up question. Uh, can you give me an example of ordinances or initiatives of mandatory spay-neuter that worked? Wow. That's a great question, and I am so glad you asked that. We absolutely do not recommend mandatory spay-neuter. Um, for anything other than you know, 
the adopted animals going out of the shelter and dangerous dogs. So that obviously should be mandatory. However, a general mandatory spay-neuter is not what works. Punitive approaches do not effectively get us where we want to be. So we recommend raising those funds and getting those collaborations going to fund fixed income pet owners. If you had a mandatory spay-neuter law, you have still a community of pet owners who cannot afford to do so. So you haven't solved anything and you've spent a lot of money enforcing an ordinance that again is not gonna get you where you want to go. You want more animals spayed and neutered and subsidizing those fixed income pet owners is the way to go. It is not true that people will not spay neuter. I promise you, um, it, all, all over the country, in places that you couldn't imagine, there are such high level. There's a high level need, and there are people that take advantage of the the low cost, under twenty dollars or free spay neuter that will decrease your shelter intake. I strongly encourage you not to think about mandatory spay neuter. Here's the next question: uh, What are the advantages of microchipping community cats? Is there data support supporting microchipping community cats? This is a great question. So as I said, Cameron, I think, probably has the most data um, from Jacksonville. And in the beginning, remember, this program was not happening in Jacksonville, so there were a lot of people um, coming out against the program and saying, you know, there was going to be – dead cats all over the place, and they were going to just be coming back and forth into the shelter. So that first year, they did have a grant. They spent over $30,000 to microchip um, those 5,400-plus cats, and they never got one of those cats back. Um, and the cats did not end up in the shelter. They had their animal control officers scanning for um, the microchips when they found a dead cat on the side of the road, and they never once found one of those cats. So we don't recommend microchipping because we have to think practically, and there is a small piece of money pie. And if we spent all of that money, like that first year, $30,000 on microchipping that ultimately they stopped doing because it did not get them to the – it did not help them reach their goal in any way, they stopped doing that. And imagine how many cats could have been sterilized for $30,000. So for that reason, we don't recommend microchipping. If you have strong opposition, you might want to do it the first year just to prove what they proved in Jacksonville. But we encourage you not to because our goal is to sterilize them and rabies vaccinate them and, again, get them out of the shelter as fast as possible if they do come into the shelter. But great question, and thank you for asking that. So the next one is I get complaints of cats using residence yards as restrooms. How do I fix this issue if we return these cats? What about cats being struck by cars or evil people harming these cats? This is also a great question. So, again, you get complaints about cats using residence yards at restrooms, and I can guarantee you that you have a neighborhood, neighborhood full of people that like cats, feed cats, they like them there maybe because of the rodents or what have you, and they're just reproducing exponentially. So you need to get a handle on sterilizing as many cats in that neighborhood as possible, and then there are deterrents that we can use in our yards. And as a homeowner, again, I don't want anybody – urinating in my grass or my front door, that's for sure. So as a homeowner, I would want to have deterrence in my yard. But again, that having the less cats is going to be the answer. So helping those areas sterilize those neighborhood cats is number one. Number two, the question is, what about evil people hurting the cats? Um, so we have a huge problem with community cats here in the United States. And cats reproducing exponentially and we do have some people coming to shelters that will say if you don't take the cat or if you bring the cat back i'm going to shoot it well we truly believe that they want their problem solved they really don't want to shoot the cat there will always be abuse and there will always be cruelty those are very very far in between 
So we don't believe that, we, we think that those are threats that people are making because as shelter workers, we're like, oh, my gosh, they're going to shoot the cat. I better take the cat in. But people just are frustrated because no one has ever solved their problem. And so we don't see um, these types of situations. We don't see um, more um, cats dying or dead bodies found or shot or poisoned or anything like that um, when these programs start in a community. But, again, it's a very, very common fear. It just doesn't happen in reality. But I totally appreciate the question. Very, very common question. Thank you. Here's a follow-up, and the gist of this one is um, that there are some people that absolutely do not want these cats returned. Uh, they're worried about fleas getting on their animals and children being bit and things like that. Are there relocation programs other than where the, the cat was trapped? Yes. So relocation programs are going to be very far at the bottom of the list. Um, they just don't work. The cat is likely going to roam and try to get back to their original location. So, again, when we think about um, this global problem and all the thousands of cats going into shelters, so every once in a while there's going to be a cat that is, you can't work out that problem. But, again, knowing um, not just the Jacksonville story but all these other communities that are doing this and returning thousands of cats – Yes, this might happen every once in a while, and we're going to work on that as an individual case and see what kind of solution we can come up with. And if we can't resolve it with that homeowner or neighbor, then our last resort is going to be relocation. But again, remember, why would that person who doesn't want the cat to step on their property, why do they have more of a right than the, than the person whose cat it is or who's feeding that cat? So we need to try to work out with those people. And, again, that's going to be something that's always going to be needed. But globally, this program will work because ultimately you are going to have less cats. And it's also what we like to see in ordinances is a respectful way. If you're going to feed cats outside, it's not a free-for-all that you have. You feed the cats once or twice a day and you pick up the bowls when they're done eating so that the environment um, stays as clean as possible and doesn't attract wildlife. But um, So you will always have, every, you know, every once in a while, these types of issues that you will have to deal with. That's never going to go away. But globally, this program will work. But appreciate the question. Thank you for asking that. So we've reached the top of the hour, but we do have some really interesting questions waiting for Dr. Pisano to answer. If you'd like to stay with us, that would be great. Um, you'll get some more answers to your questions. Um, so we will go over probably by about 10 minutes. Our next question is, would you recommend a community cat caregiver caretaker registry? Do you have an example of how it might be helpful? These are such great questions, and I'm so glad people are asking these because these are things that I didn't fit into the presentation, so very good question. No, we don't believe there is any reason to have a registry. Again, people make try to make these programs much more complicated than they need to be. So what we need to do is sterilize the cats and vaccinate them and ear tip them and put them back where they were found. We don't have to know who is feeding them. Um, again, this type of thing makes a lot of work for a lot of people, but doesn't really accomplish anything. So if we can just help these, and, and we'll drive people underground, um, if we could just help these people who are perhaps feeding cats outside sterilize and ear tip them, that's what's going to make the difference. But absolutely no need for a registry. Great question, and thanks for asking that. And here's another good question. What about areas that have extreme harsh winters as in well below zero and high rates of predators? Another great question. I keep saying that. I sound like a broken record, but this is actually a conversation we're having on the Million Cat Challenge listserv right now. So we have to think about a couple of things. Right now in the northern part of the United States, there are many cats that live outside year-round, and there are still community cat issues and exponential reproduction. So these cats 
are surviving outside um, already. So I feel that we just need to get out of their way since they are already surviving in those harsh winters before they were trapped and sterilized. Um, I don't know what the solution would be when there's areas that have predators. That's going to be no different. We are never going to be able to get every single cat to live inside. But again, um, cats are doing, they're smart about hiding, they're smart about staying safe from predators. So I don't really think there's anything we can do about that except, again, decrease the number of cats that will be outside through community cat diversion and TNR. Harsh winters and returning cats after surgery, we need to just use our common sense. So no different than in Florida, if there was a hurricane, we wouldn't be returning cats that week or, you know, right around the hurricane, we would perhaps watch the weather, and if we were going to get a blizzard in one of our northern states, we wouldn't be trapping for a couple of days before so those cats could make sure they get to their hiding spots with plenty of time. We also have some of our northern partners that use um, either the ice, the the, um, styrofoam containers, or build some makeshift um, housing for cats. So those are some other ideas. But we we do think this is can be just as successful, and we just have to be a little more sensitive to any extreme weather wherever you are in the country. Thank you. Here's the next question. There are some lost cats, escaped indoor cats, or indoor-outdoor cats. Are you suggesting that there should be no stray hold for these cats as well? Right. So, again, we have to think about globally our shelter intake and the cats that are outside. And what percentage of cats are an escaped indoor cat? So the answer is typically that's going to be a very, very low number. If, you know, every once in a while, yes, that might happen. We are suggesting any cat that was found outside that's of good body weight and large enough for spay-neuter um, to be sterilized, ear-chipped, rabies vaccinated, and put back to their original home without any stray hold. Now, that's not to say a shelter is not going to hold a cat. If they have identification and they're trying to contact the owner, that should be an individual shelter decision when a cat like that enters. But again, the studies are showing that they even have, um, if this did happen, that and that cat has a far better chance of getting adopted from the street than a shelter. So either way, um, it will end up fine. But, again, we have to think about the thousands of cats that are going into most shelters, and that might happen maybe twice a year. We get an inside cat that escapes. So we have to, we have to try to – we're trying to save the most animals here, and we're trying to make an impact to help most of the animals. So that's how we have to think about it. But again, it's an individual shelter decision. We can always hold a cat um, when we when we think we have a lead on an owner. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. This is a great idea, but who's paying for the spay? Right, so that goes back to what I was saying about logistics and who does what. So these, the communities that are the most successful with these programs have public-private collaborations. So that means they're perhaps, you know, somehow the public shelter is contributing. Again, in Huntsville, in Boone County, Kentucky, they are, the ACOs are returning the cats. In other places, a nonprofit is raising money through their regular revenue streams, which might be grant money, donations, fees for services. So this is a whole pie chart of who is doing what logistically, who is actually doing the program, and who is paying for the program. That is a big pie chart that can look like anything in in each community, can look different in each community. So we'll take uh, one more question and then end for the evening. Uh, Why 90%? What determines this number? Very good question. You know, I think it's just based on looking at successful shelters right now and animal welfare and even large shelters are getting to 90% or over. So that is why we think it's because we're seeing so many more shelters now, 
achieving that, again, recognizing there will always be euthanasia, mind you, if it's 89%, maybe that is the appropriate number for that particular shelter that year um, or whatever time period. So I think it's based on looking at shelters that are successful and are those open admission shelters are getting to that 90% and better. Thank you. Um, I wanted to remind the audience that we have a second webcast today at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't registered, um, go ahead and register for that and join us this evening. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pisano, for your presentation. Well, I appreciate everyone listening, and we encourage you to take these ideas to your public officials, and thank you again to Maddie's Fund.